alikuzai alika zuzura andi na makuzai des thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you because every day your love your steadfast love is renewed towards us thank you for your faithfulness thank you for your passionate commitment towards us the passionate con- commitment that sponsors the continuity of your work for you are faithful oh lord we worship you this morning and we give you the glory we bless your holy name and we just want to say we love you lord us from your holy habitation this morning and empower our spirit to catch a revelation from you that our life may be driven by the counsel that comes from your presence and that we may direct our lives and our fears in the way that you have marked out for us as we journey to a destination called life let your oracle speak this morning give us utterance give us your word of grace that is able to build us give us an inheritance which you are along with all the saints and may Jesus be glorified this morning in our worship in Jesus most powerful name we pray Amen and amen. I am so excited to be speaking to you again. Really is going to be today. I'm super excited to be speaking to you guys again um on this um broadcast um Apostle Victor is my name. And of course, this is Life Spring Assembly and um I want to thank God for you. I want to thank God for your family. I want to thank God for what he's been doing in our lives. I want to thank God for what he's doing generally in this season. Um, and we have been like a trumpet sounding a distinct sound communicating God's intention to a generation and we we trust that God who works all things out according to his plan um and who has factored you in will finish his work even in the name of Jesus. And my prayer this morning is that you will be at the cutting edge of the works that God is doing. You will be at the cutting edge of the plans of God that God will find your life worthy of inclusion in his divine plan, in his mysterious plan which is Christ that a place will be carved out for you and that you will not relinquish your position as Adam did. Um, but you will flourish in it and you will become a gateway by which many will find our lord in jesus most precious name and i pray that god gives you understanding this morning as we once again um eat um from the meal that god will serve us this morning okay um um the title of this morning service um is covenant life and um, i i gave the hint on friday uh, when i was speaking about covenant um i gave a hint that we we're, we're going to be continuing today and we'll be speaking about the covenant life okay and if we were to pull a quick recap from friday i spoke about covenant being a legal agreement that two or more people can get into um by which um every party involved in the agreement have a a legal um uh, commitment okay um and there are terms and conditions around a covenant and i said god usually would start with people by on the on the basis of promise um and promises are what becomes covenant it is when god puts his sovereign and and divine commitment into a journey that he has started with a man 
and God will then ratify the commitment he has made um, to a person or a community or a group of people, a, a city, a nation. God will ratify his commitment to them by cutting a covenant. Okay, and I said covenants, the, uh, the record of the agreement and the transaction um, that takes place in a covenant is captured in the most reliable record keeping system, which is blood. Okay, blood is the record bearer. It is the testimony carrier for a covenant. Um, hence why um, even in the in the world when they are to enter into covenant with deities, the deities will demand for blood um, so that the, the, the utterances um, and the commitment that the deity demands from the subject um, that is getting into a covenant with will be recorded by blood and so the deity has a legal right and access into the life of his subjects and by blood also the subjects have a right to invoke the deity um, and we saw this on we, we can we can see this in scripture um, if you look at um, the life of Elijah Okay, we look at Elijah um, when he challenged Israel in their idol worship and he told them that if you're going to serve God, serve God. If you're going to serve Baal, serve Baal. You cannot serve God and serve Baal at the same time. And then he told, he summoned all the prophets of Baal and he challenged them to a showdown. Okay, he told them, look, I'm going to raise an altar unto the Lord. You raise an altar unto your own God and sacrifice on the altar, and I'll sacrifice on the altar that I raised to my God, and then we would call upon our God, and then we'll see which one answers. Okay, and you we, we saw in that showdown how the the prophets of Baal were the ones that went first, so they sacrificed on the altar and they began to call their God, and their God didn't show up. Okay, and they, they, they were spilling blood um, to a point where when the blood of bulls and, 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 and animals couldn't were good enough to invoke the presence of their gods, they began to cut themselves. Okay, they began to cut themselves, and what it means by cutting themselves is they are trying to remind and wake this deity in case the deity was sleeping. To say, look, it is it is we are the ones, we are your subjects. Have you forgotten us? Okay, just in case, if you don't remember through the blood of bulls, um, here is our blood. And let this blood testify that we have been serving you. Well, because there was a bigger power um, involved and their deity would not confront God in the fight. Their deity didn't show up. So, blood um, is a record-keeping system that gives legitimate access to um, parties involved in a covenant. Okay, and um, I think I went as far as saying that covenant existed before um, the time of Noah when it was first mentioned in the Bible. Um, the relationship of God with man when he made them, the intention of God was to operate and to relate with man based on covenant okay so the family relationship between god and man was a covenant relationship and that that relationship uh that covenant is called the covenant of perfect fellowship okay and that was what adam broke adam broke the fellowship he broke the covenant he broke he betrayed god okay he broke the trust that god had in him and so um that gave birth to the evolution of rebellion um by which the civilization that we have come to meet with was pioneered, okay? It was pioneered on the path of rebellion. Um, and, and, and Jesus came to restore the order that was truncated, the order that was broken by Adam, okay? So the first Adam was a breaker of covenant and the second Adam was a broker of covenant, okay? He came to broker a deal between God and man by which God can once again enter into an unbreakable um, and into a perfect union, perfect fellowship with man. And this was the covenant that God made um, 
and, and, and we, we saw littered across the scripture in the prophecies by the prophets of old as they were inspired and moved by the Holy Spirit, they began to prophesy. And we saw in Isaiah chapter 59 from verse 20 how the Lord began to tell the people through the prophet Isaiah that their Redeemer will come to Jerusalem and that it, it, this is the covenant he's making with them that he will, uh, his spirit will never leave them. And of course, even the word that he has spoken to them, that this word will be in their mouth, it will be in the mouth of their children, it will be in the mouth of their children's children, um, that his spirit will never leave them alone. Um, and if we look at the book of Osea as well, um, chapter 6, from verse 6 and 7, we can see that this, uh, from verse 5 and 6, 5, 6, 7, you can see how scripture mentioned the fact that Adam broke the relationship he had with God. He broke covenant with God. And if you look at um, Joel chapter 2 verse 28, you begin to see again how the Spirit of God began to speak, began to foretell through um, the prophet Joel, how God will in the last days pour out His Spirit upon all flesh and, 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 their, and their, their sons will prophesy, their, their old ones will dream dreams, their sons and daughters will um, prophesy, they will see visions. Um, and he will pour out his spirit upon the male servants, the female servants alike. Um, so we see that God's promise was, and the covenant that God was to bring us into um, in the latter times, which we are now in, um, the covenant that was ratified by the shedding of the blood of Jesus, that was captured and kept by the blood of Jesus, um, is the covenant of an eternal, unbroken fellowship with God. Okay, this is the covenant. It is the covenant of an unbroken fellowship. And so, um, I'm going to show you some scriptures this morning. And I'm going to trust God to minister to your spirit. I do not, my passion is, I do not want uh, people in church to misunderstand or walk in darkness or be ignorant of these divine and spiritual ordinances. Just like Apostle Paul said to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and he says he wouldn't have them ignorant. He wouldn't have them be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. I, I, I don't want the church to be ignorant of certain things that um, we have made customs and traditions of in the church, but these things do not represent the notion, the intentions in the heart of the Father for bringing us into these um, um, realities. So from things like sacrifice to covenants to altar um, to um, sowing and, and things like that, um, all of these things has been grossly um, misunderstood and it has accounted for the decline in our quality of spiritual worship in the church. And, and it is my passion um, as uh, given by the Holy Spirit to begin to bring perspective and to bring revelation and to bring insight um, to bring God's perspective to the church so that we can begin to rise on a corporate rank of holiness and, and, and arise up in authority um, to take dominion and to do the will of our Father for which he chose us from the foundations of the earth. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, he, 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 he made us, he created us in Christ for good works before the foundation of the earth that we should walk in it. Okay, so let's look at scriptures this morning. And I pray God gives you understanding in Jesus' name. I'm speaking about covenant life. And I will be showing you that when, when a man enters into a covenant with God, or when God enters into a covenant with man, there is a life that is expected, that is supposed to be a consequence of a covenant that is now in, in action, in motion. Okay? There is a life that is expected. And a deviation from this life will lead to breaking of a covenant. And we already see the repercussion of a broken covenant. Um, Adam broke a covenant and we are still just about trying to recover embracing the new covenant that Jesus came to broker um, to replace um, the covenant that Adam broke or to bring us into even a better covenant with God because this one will be an eternal covenant it will never be broken that's what the spirit of god that's what god promised by his spirit um, as he spoke through the prophets uh, so let's look at scriptures i want to start with the man abraham i mean abraham is very very pivotal because he was the first man that god began 
this um, covenant dealing with, okay? This covenant dealing of of creating for himself a family, of pioneering a family in the earth, and creating a path for a generation yet to be born to walk in. Okay? And so Jesus coming, he came in the similitude, in the similitude of um, the way that God pioneered through Abraham, okay, who became our progenitor, who became our father, because the way that God created or uh, prepared for us to access salvation and to access an inheritance um, which is his kingdom um, by his spirit is the way of faith. It is by faith that we will be justified, okay? And Abraham was the man who was first justified um, by faith to model this way, okay? To model this way. Um, it wasn't the only, it wasn't the first person that had faith in God, but it was the first person that was truly justified by faith and that God showed as an example of this pathway. Um, so let's look at the life of Abraham. I want to show you a couple of things in the life of Abraham this morning. And then, of course, we would um, go to the meat of the matter. In Genesis chapter 15, okay? If you have your Bibles, I want you to take it with me. In Genesis chapter 15, um, we would look at God's promise to Abraham, okay? God's promise to Abraham. And I want to show you something quickly this morning. So Genesis chapter 15, let me just read scriptures to you, and then you will understand um, what the Spirit is saying this morning. So Genesis chapter 15 verse 1 says, Some time later, the Lord spoke to Abraham in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abraham, for I will protect you, and your reward will be great. Now Abraham replied, verse 2, Excuse me. But Abraham replied, Oh, sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own. So one of my servants will be my heir. Now, follow me closely this morning. This was Abraham's lament, lamentation, okay? He, he, he protested the statement that God made when God says, Look, I, I will be your reward. I will bless you. I will protect you and I will be your reward. So Abraham exclaimed. This thought had been in his heart. He had been pondering upon this. That look. This, this God that I've encountered, this deity that I've encountered, this deity that has called me into a journey and that I've heeded his voice had now begun to bless me. He had begun to lift me up. He had begun to give me a name. Because at this time, Abraham had gone to the battle of kings and he had won a mighty victory. And he knew that God was responsible for this. So his name was, it was becoming famous. And he was acquiring wealth. Because at this point as well, he had been to Egypt, he had been back. But the Bible says he, he came back from Egypt, Genesis chapter 13. He says, and Abraham was very rich in gold, in silver, in cattle, in servants, in male and female servants. He was extremely rich. So at this time, Abraham had wealth. He had possessions. And he, his name was beginning to get famous. And so Abraham figured, okay. This God is making good of his promises. But I am getting old. Who will inherit all of these things? Who will inherit my estate? And seeing that I have no child, the leader of my household, so Abraham had now given the responsibility of um, his heir to a servant who now watches over his household. And Abraham now panics. That should he go childless, this man will inherit his household, will inherit everything he owns. But this is what God says. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will inherit, who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. 
that's how many your descendants will have. That's how many descendants you will have. And verse 6, and Abraham believed the Lord. And the Lord counted him as, a, as righteous because, because of his faith. Abraham believed that God was able to make good of his, of his promise. And verse 7 says, And the Lord told him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the awe of the Chaldeans to give you this land as your possession. And then Abraham answered again. But Abraham replied, Oh, sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I would actually possess it? And then God told Abraham to bring him a sacrifice. Okay? So God says, Look, um, Abraham was saying, How can I be sure? God says, okay, let's enter into a covenant. By this covenant, you can be sure. And by this covenant, I am committed to making good of my promise. So they entered into a covenant. Okay? As regarding God giving Abraham um, possession of land. But if we jump right to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 16. Now remember, what I wanted to bring out of the Genesis chapter 15 was that Abraham proposed to God or Abraham expressed to God his concern about his childlessness and how he feels like his estate will be inherited by a person that is not his descendant, that is not his child, okay? A servant in his house. And God gave him a response. God told him no. And no means no. God told him no. Your servant will not be your heir. You will have your own son. Now, the problem with men or the problem that we often face or we often fall victim to as men, is that I haven't received the promise from God, I haven't heard God's verdict about a matter, we do not pay heed to dealing and relating with God and being careful to relate with God based on the relationship that has been marked out by covenant. And that is my, my topic of contemplation this morning, covenant life. We do not become careful to live a life that is consistent with the terms of our agreement. And the problem is a deviation from a life that is consistent with the requirement that has been captured within the covenant will lead into the breaking of the covenant and it will make God incapable of delivering, of making good of his part of the bargain. And, and so God wanted to begin to tell Abraham and God wanted to make a strong statement about how there is a life that must be when, when there is covenant is requisite for a life. A life must proceed from an agreement that has been ratified by covenant. So in Genesis chapter 16, something happened. And I want you to follow me carefully as I read. Genesis chapter 16 from verse 1. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had not been able to bear children for him. But she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. Now, what does Egypt mean here? Egypt means the world. Okay? Egypt represented the world here. And so she had the world in her home. Did you see this? They had, they had the world in their home. But the problem now is... They have now been, this world is about to cause an influence that will set man against God. So, follow me. They had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. And then verse 2. So, Sarai said to Abraham, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Now, let me pause here for a little bit. Now, I'm sorry to say this, but it is consistent with scripture. The devil, who is the who is the spirit that is at work in the world, according to Ephesians chapter 2, isn't it? The Bible says he is the spirit who is now at work in the children of the disobedience. The prince of the power of the air. So the devil is the ruler. He is the prince of this world. He is the ruler of this world. 
And so Hagar represented the world because she represented Egypt in the house of Abraham. And so Sarai said to Abraham, the Lord has prevented me. So she, she came to a conclusion. Did you see this? She came to a conclusion and I want to show you similarity between this and what happened in the garden. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes this morning and I saw it. It showed me. And I saw it. The problem that because God was about to pioneer a new family with Abraham. God was about to pioneer a family that would lead, that would lead back to him. Okay? A family through which God will establish a covenant that can never ever and will never be broken. The covenant of perfect fellowship. But before God could do that, God had to show Abraham what was wrong with the life he had. Did you see this? And so, Sarai concluded that God had prevented her from having children. Because you see, every time God speaks, God comes to speak to Abraham. Never have we seen in scripture that God came to speak to Sarah. God came to speak to Abraham and Abraham's assignment was to intimate Sarah with the promise of God over the house. Do you understand this? So, Sarai was the one that came to this conclusion. The Lord has prevented me from having children. Now, the problem and the reason why God could not make good his promise in the life of Abraham now was because Abraham was still alive. And the narrative that God wanted to pioneer with Abraham was that God is a God who can give life to the dead. And who justifies the ungodly. Did you see this? So God was writing a story with Abraham. And should Abraham have known how to journey with God. And known how to live a covenant life. He would have known that to a covenant life is a life of death. Okay. You die. Because on the altar. What happens on the altar, at the altar is death. Okay. A, 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 a life must be taken. The blood which captures the details of that life will be shed. And that becomes the platform by which a covenant is set in motion but at this point Abraham was journeying with God but he doesn't yet fully understand how to live a life that is consistent with the covenant that this God is trying to enact with him so Abraham was still alive so the only means or the only means that God could employ to really walk with Abraham and to make sure that his plan with Abraham comes to fruition and is not truncated was to use the, the weapon or the instrument of time. God was going to use the instrument of time to wear out the life that Abraham still holds on to. Okay? So the intention of God was that time will deal a blow to Abraham and Abraham will die. Okay? So in the course of time, Abraham will be past childbearing age. He will, he will be Every, every faculty of his biological infrastructure responsible for procreating will be dead. And so also will be the same in Sarah. Then God will make good of the narrative of the fact that God gives life to the dead. But should Abraham know how to die, God will start to work because all God needed here was a dead man. But since Abraham didn't know how to die, the only way God can employ was to use time to kill him. But you see, this revelation was far away and, and Abraham had already, he had, he had begun to journey because he, he, he believed that God was able to do what, what God said he would do. But how God would do it, he doesn't really know yet. Do you understand this? He doesn't fully know yet. And Sarai does not even, she doesn't even have a clue. So, a verdict about what was going on was that God had decided that she wouldn't have a child. But that's not true. Because God had promised Abraham that his servant will not inherit him. That Abraham will have a son. And God is not oblivious of the fact that Abraham's wife is Sarah or Sarai at the time. So, this is what happened. Sarai came to a conclusion the Lord has prevented me from having children. Then she said, go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abraham agreed with Sarai's proposal. 
So Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abraham as a wife. Now, this was exactly what happened to Adam. God was in a relationship. He was in a covenant relationship with this family, the family of Adam. Okay? This family of Adam, God. God was in a covenant relationship with this family. And according to the covenant that God had with Adam, God gave him a life. And the life is, God gave him a mandate. He gave him a life. And the life is, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion. And eat of all the trees and all the fruit in the garden. But there is one that you must not touch. And it is the tree of the knowledge of good evil. It means it is the tree of the knowledge of what seems good but is evil. Now, that is, the, that is the fabric of the world, isn't it? Is There are things that look like it's good. But because there is no God in it, it is still evil. I don't care how nice it looks, it is still evil. So prosperity is good, but any prosperity that does not come from God is evil prosperity. That is good evil. And this tree produces fruit, all manner of fruit of good evil. Marriage is good, isn't it? But any marriage that does not stand on the foundation of God is a good evil marriage. Do you understand this? Education looks like it's good. But any education that the core value of that education is to lead people to God, anything that deviates from this is a good evil education. Business is good. But if that business is not based on the foundation of the principles and the values and the, and the, and the, and the, and the interest of God, it is a good evil business. And so you think of anything, fashion, media, government, all of these things look like they are good. Giving is good. But if this giving is not rooted on Christ, then it is a good evil given. And that is what Apostle Paul was attempting to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when he was talking about love. He says, let me show you a most of us in, in chapter 12. He has spoken about spiritual gifts and how we should eagerly desire spiritual gifts and how we should desire the gifts of prophecy. And he spoke about the diverse gifts of the Spirit and then he said, let me show you a more excellent way. And then he opened chapter 13 by, by, by speaking about love. And he says, love is patient, love is kind. No, no, before he got to love is patient, love is kind. He began to speak. He says, if I have all the faith in the world, if I have the faith to move mountains, but have no love, it is a waste of time. He says, if I give so generously that I even give myself to the flames, give myself and have no love, I have done it in vain. He says, if I speak in tongues of men and even in tongues of angels, but have no love, I am just a resounding gong and a clinging symbol. Did you see this? And the Bible says, love is God, isn't it? The book of 1 John, it began to show us how love is God, how God is love. So he's saying that faith that is not rooted and based on God is good, evil faith. Given, sacrifice. Whatever it is that you call good, that you look and you say, oh, that's good. Having children is good. But if your having children is not to fulfill the plans and the purposes of God and to model the morals of God's kingdom, then it is a good, evil bearing of children. So the tree that Adam ate of in the garden is a tree of good evil. It simply means attain, try to do good things, but don't do it on God's timetable. Don't do it via God's means and via God's way. Let God not be the pilot that drives you towards this destination of good. Do good, but do it on your own terms. Do it according to your own description, according to your own definition, and according to your own means. And so we see around us men, um, uh, um, influential and powerful men trying to build civilizations and pioneer different things, void of God. Education system, no God. Political system, no God. Economic system, no God. Family system, social system, no God. And we see all of these things, our society has been carefully crafted and built to tell people 
that your destiny is in your hands. Your destiny could never be in your hands. The Bible says the ways of a man are not even before him. The ways of a man are not before him. Your life was decided before it was given you. And God has an expectation over your life. And anything else you try to accomplish with your life outside of God's expectation is good evil. I don't care how good it looks, it, it will be evil. And that was why when some people went try, were trying to call Jesus good teacher, Jesus rebuked them. He says, don't call me good. Don't call me good until you know that I am God. It is only what is God that is good. It is not everything that is good that is God. So don't call me good. Because that good you're talking about is according to your own definition. And I am not good according to your definition. I am good because I am rooted on God. I am of God and from God. That is what makes me good. My life is ordered by the good God. The one who alone can give a verdict of what is good. So, but you see, in scriptures, Adam didn't by himself go take the fruit and eat it. Eve was deceived by the enemy, the devil, and she ate the fruit first. And then she gave it to Adam. Now, it is the same thing that happened here. And that broke the covenant, isn't it? The same thing happened here. Sarai conceived in her heart. You see, to sin is to conceive. Yeah, the book of James. It says temptation. It says God is not tempted, so he doesn't tempt anyone. It says, but when you are overtaken by temptation, it is by the desires of your heart that draws you away. And it says, and when temptation is conceived, it becomes sin. And when sin is fully matured, it gives birth to death, isn't it? So Sarah had a desire. She seen other women having children. And she so desired to have children. But because she lacks understanding of the fullness of the scope of what God is doing, she got to a conclusion. So she was tempted and she conceived it. Okay? And our verdict was that God is punishing me. God has made up his mind. He has prevented me from having children. Okay? So she now ate this fruit of good evil. Saying, look, let's find an alternative. Okay? The natural order is that a man marries a woman and two of them will be together and then they will give birth. Okay? So, Sarah proposed polygamy. Did you see this? She proposed polygamy. She proposed a libra ando no mokusalam. She proposed a rika ando skipale. A deviation from God's eternal good. She brought the fruit of good evil to Abraham. Or Abraham at this time. She said, hey, um, since God has prevented me from having children, here is my servant. Here is Egypt. Here is the world. I need you to sleep. I have a relationship. Did you see this? In break. Katuku paradi namako saita. Bariku adaba. Break your soul dependency on the promise of God. And, and have an affair. Have a conjugal relationship with the world. Egypt. Ega. And Abraham ate the fruit. He ate the fruit. He ate this fruit of good evil. Because he seemed right to Abraham. But well, there is a way that seemed right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. So Abraham slept. Abraham took the Egyptian girl. Abraham ate the fruit. Abraham took this alternative. Abraham already knows the destination that God had in mind and is that he would have descendants. But Abraham now will take the decision of how it must happen out of the hand of God. And he will decide it now based on the suggestion that came from his wife. The one who always brings the fruit. And so Abraham ate the fruit. Verse 4 says, And Abraham had sexual relations with Hagar. Abraham had a relationship. He had intercourse with the world. So he mixed with the world. And she became pregnant. 
But when Ega knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarai with contempt. She just manifested the character of the world, isn't it? She just, she just manifested. She is a world. And immediately she received a seed from the man who carried covenant. She manifested the world. And of course, you know the story. Um, Sarah was Sarah then felt bad now. And she even put the blame on Abraham and she went to Abraham and complained. And, and, and Abraham um, Abraham sent the, the woman away. Abraham sent the woman away. But look at what happens in Genesis chapter 17. And then God came to Abraham. When Abraham does die, pay attention to this now. When Abraham was 99 years old. Now at this point now, his body was now dead. Now this was the timeline of God. But Abraham didn't wait for this timeline. Before the timeline of God, before the timing of God, Aruf, Abraham had eaten from the tree of good evil. He had taken an alternative to the roots that God was planning for him to walk through. And so God came to Abraham. When Abraham was 19, when Abraham was 99 years old, sorry, I'm, I'm going to be call, I call him Abraham because, hey, but you know what I mean, Abraham. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Do you know what this means? I am the all-sufficient God, the one who needs no human help. The one who is God all by himself. The one who takes counsel from nobody. I am El Shaddai. I am the mighty, the sovereign God. The all sufficient God. The one who decides the existence of everything that exists. That is what El Shaddai means. He is the all-sufficient, the strong one. I am the strong one. I am so strong, I need no aid. I need no help, Abraham. I am the El Shaddai, the strong one. And then he says, serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. And if you go, if you break trash in scripture, there are two people that has been made that the scripture had mentioned to have lived a blameless life. Okay? The first of them was Enoch. Bible says he walked in close fellowship with God and God took him. And the second one was Noah. Bible says he was the only righteous man found on that. And I explained why Noah was pronounced righteous. It wasn't because, and Bible says he was the only righteous man on earth and he was without fault. He was without fault. And I explained that the, the statement that God made um, saying Abraham, um, saying Noah was without fault doesn't mean that he was devoid of fault. It, it was a product of covenant, okay? It was a verdict of Abraham falling in the line. It was a prophetic, it was a prophetic voice for his time. It was, it was charting a course that has been pioneered by his forebears who had entered into a covenant with God. And by this covenant, it was time for God to make a crucial decision that would affect the covenant. So God had to preserve the covenant. So he pronounced Noah to be a righteous man without blame because of covenant. And the Bible also said that uh, the Bible also said that Noah walked in close fellowship with God. Okay. And walking in close fellowship with God simply means being careful to observe and to lead a life worthy of covenant. So. The Lord came to Abraham and said to him, Look, the, what, what you have done, the life that you have lived up until now, has not shown that you understand the gravity of the relationship that I entered into with you. You don't really understand this thing, do you, Abraham? I am El Shaddai. I am the God who needs no help. I am the God who needs no assistance. Walk before me. Because up until now, 
God has even told Abraham his name. Abraham has been dealing with God, the one who appeared to him. And what says he built an altar to the God who spoke to him. This was the first time God was telling Abraham his name. To so say, look, I am the God who doesn't need your help, Abraham. So there is a life that is expected of you if you are conscious of this relationship that we have. And what you have done is that you have chosen a life for yourself. And this doesn't work with the covenant that we have. It will mess up the agreement that we have. And so God then told Abraham, he says, I will make a covenant with you. Live a blameless life, Abraham, and I will make a covenant with you. By which I will guarantee you countless descendants. You see, God now spoke about, to say, look, Abraham, all you could have done was to focus on my utterance, the things that I have said to you. Not take, make a decision based on the emotions of your wife. Because this decision was made based on the matter that Sarai brought to Abraham, isn't it? So Abraham didn't live a life that was consistent and conforms to the terms of covenant. And so the Lord said to him, I will make you I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee you countless descendants. And at this, Abraham fell to the ground. And this was worship. He worshiped God now as El Shaddai. Did you see this? He worshiped God now as the sovereign one who, who needs no help and who can do everything he promises all by himself. And then God said to him, this is my covenant with you. I will make you father of a multitude of nations. And what's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abraham. Instead, you will be called Abraham. For you will become the father of many nations and kings will be among them. Oh, verse 6 says, I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will come, will become many nations and kings will be among them. And verse 7 says, I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants. Did you see this? When I was thinking about altars, I said altars are platform upon which God confirms a covenant he had made with the previous generation. And when, if you read through scriptures, when God confirmed this covenant with Isaac and confirmed this covenant with Jacob, it was on the platform of altars. And so God was saying here that I will confirm the covenant with your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant now. This is the everlasting covenant. I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. So God was saying, this is my everlasting covenant. The destination that we are going, that I'm going with you, Abraham, is that at some point, At some point, the fulfillment of this covenant is that I will enter into a relationship with you that will never be broken again. But this relationship has a life that is required. That must be a consequence um, of someone who consciously carries the understanding of being in a covenant with God. So God was pointing to Abraham that you, you, you're just, you're just behaving exactly like Adam. And, and the, the consequence of what Adam did, of eating the tree of the fruit of the tree of good evil, is sin. And the corruption in the world, and death, and all the turmoil, and the madness that is going on right now that we have not even fully recovered from. And the same thing, the fruit of good, uh, of the tree of good evil that Adam ate, in sleeping with the world, Eda, and giving birth to a child called Ishmael, gave birth to a rebellion in the earth that we are yet to recover from, isn't it? And the Lord prophesied, He revealed the destiny of the child. He said, He will be in open hostility towards all His brethren. He will, he will be in hostility towards all His brethren. And his brethren will be the descendants of Abraham. Did you see this? It means there will be there will be war in your house. There will be war, death, destruction in your house because you took the root 
of what seemed good but is evil. Because when Abraham had a child, now he is happy. He was happy. Aha! After all, I'm not barren. I have given birth to a child that carries my blood. But God is saying, no, that child is in your own image. It's not in my image because it is not according to promise. It is not according to good, according to God. It is only good for you, Abraham. And you see, in that good is the evil. And you cannot avoid, you must eat and partake of the evil as well. And the evil that Abraham ate by those actions he took, the consequence is still in the world till today. And it will be until the world is no more. So, one lesson you should learn from that is if you take and you make decisions that has no God in it, that is not built around satisfying the desires of God, the consequence will never depart from you. God can help you, but you will, you will, you will suffer the consequence and it will be with you. And you're not the only one that will, that will pay, that will suffer the consequence. Your descendants, because if you break covenant, the consequence of breaking covenant will be also with you to your descendants. And if you keep covenant, the benefits of keeping the covenant will also be to you and your descendants. You want to write that down. So, now we see, and then let me show you. So God made this covenant with, uh, with, with, Adam, with um, Abraham and it continued in verse 9 so genesis chapter 17 verse 9 i want to show you um i want to focus now on the life um and i'm going to attempt to round up very soon okay so god said in genesis chapter 17 verse 9 he says that god said to abraham your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant did you see this now your response your responsibility, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your, this is the time now, you and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. Sorry, we're not, we're not here. From verse 10 is the times. But God was giving him a heads up that this covenant will now pioneer for you a way of life. It will pioneer for you and your descendants a way of life. It will be a covenant life. You are no longer the Abraham you used to be. You are no longer the man who just eats of the tree of good evil at will, attempting to fulfill God's desire. You are a man who enters into a covenant with God and is conscious of the terms of the agreement and pioneers and lives a life that conforms to the terms captured within the covenant. Ratified by blood. Your responsibility is to obey the time of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. Verse 10 now, this is the responsibility that they have. This is the life that they must live. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh. You must remove Egypt. Did you see this? Because now, Abraham had even for that yoked himself with the flesh. And the flesh had already given back to a descendant. Oh my God. Had already given birth to a child that would multiply. And unfortunately, because Abraham was already blessed, and the blessing, the, the gifts of God is without repentance, because Abraham was already blessed, he, he was already blessed with greatness. So everything that comes out of him will be great. Even his mistakes will be great. So be careful when you are anointed. Be careful when you are anointed. Be careful when God begins to call covenant with you and God begins to make mighty pronouncements towards your life. Because if you turn towards error, that error also will be magnified by the strength that is already at work in you. So, Abraham gave birth to an error called Ishmael. And because Ishmael came out of Abraham, Ishmael had, he became great. Because God already promised Abraham greatness. And this greatness also extends to his descendants, you see. 
And so God told him now, so now from now on, it becomes an eternal, everlasting ordinance. From now on, continuously, you must live by this. It must be a way, it must be a culture. Culture is a way of life, isn't it? It must be a culture in your family that every male child that is born, on the eighth day, you must cut off flesh from them. And this is the spiritual ramification. This is the spiritual implication of cutting off the flesh. It is the it is the intentional, deliberate removing from you the world to be separated unto God. Did you see this? And it is the branding of God that is upon this as his family. You know, when you in Africa, then when you we in Africa, it was a domestic thing to to rear animals. Okay, so you would have families will have goats and 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 chickens and, and, and dogs and things like that and because chickens will give birth to many um, chicks that would become chickens and hens and cocks and all, all of that and, and goats would give birth to, to their children as well um, and because um, these domestic animals they often look alike okay they often share similar colors especially chickens so what people would do back in the I mean I, I still I still remember back in Africa because my, my mom used to rear we used to have our only two family poultry and we had so many chickens and there were a lot of them. We had a massive cage and you open the cage in the morning and they just, they just fly out like, like the breeze. Um, and then in the evening they'll come back in. And so what we would do is, or what people would do is, they would take a dye. Okay, you take a strong colored dye and you put them on the feathers of the, of the chicks. Right when they were chicks, you put a dye on them. Okay, branding them as your own. And as they grow up, the dye will not fade away. The dye will be there. The dye will grow on their feather as they grow up. And so when people see it, they will say, Oh, that is Mrs. ABC's chicken. That, that is Mrs. ABC's chicken. Also, people will take like a piece of cloth and they will tie it on the feather of the chicken. Okay? They will tie it on the feather of the chicken. And some people uh, in, in, in this part of the world where people have cats and stuff, you will put a collar on your car. Okay, so that when people see the car, they will know this car has an owner, it belongs to someone. So God's branding on Abraham's family that distinguished him from every other human being on earth because the, the world was filled with human beings. And so God put a sign, a branding, and the branding that God put upon Abraham and, and his descendants that was separate them from every other person in the world that was causing separation is that God said there must be a token of this covenant represented in your flesh. It is the cutting away of the first skin. Which is, so, um, and this eventually became a stumbling block and a snare to the Egyptians because they then just thought that it is just cutting of flesh from their manhood. But it was it, it is it, these things are the shadow, they are shadows of spiritual ordinance. What God intended or what God was communicating was you must intentionally remove flesh from you. You must intentionally separate yourself from the world to become, to be a member of the family of God and to consciously walk in the understanding is a deliberate reminder. At every moment in your life to separate yourself from the world. I was says, come out from among them and be separate, say the Lord, touch no unclean thing and I will receive thee and I will be your father and you will be my sons and my daughters. And so God said the life that you must live and so the Calibra and those. God's branding is not just a mark. Did you see this? It was not just a physical cutting away of skin. It was a. It was an understanding that is supposed to be born into the into the into the spirit, into the soul. It was be, it was be woven into the fabric. It was formed the fundamental beliefs of every member of Abraham's family that we are separate and we are separated from the world. The cutting away of the first skin, and this must become a life. That every descendant of Abraham must adopt in order to keep. So living this life is keeping covenant. Living a life that is a division from this life is breaking fellowship. So you understand that the fellowship that the, the, the covenant that God made with Abraham transcends just giving him lands and giving him an Isaac. No. It was God was pioneering a bloodline. God was pioneering a, a faith line, a spirit a spirit government nation that lives in the consciousness of separation from the world. 
this was the covenant life that God wanted Abraham to keep and he told him that they must keep this life you must cut off the flesh of the foreskin as a sign of the covenant between you and me from generation to generation every male child must so you see here again it is the male child why didn't God say cut off a skin from your arm because if they were to cut off a skin from their arm maybe it would have been possible for the females to be circumcised but you see the circumcision only touches the male and the way the women partake of this covenant is that they it is by union so the same thing the life we are the bride of Christ isn't it we are the bride of Christ and the life what makes us alive is our union with Christ. Did you see this? So apart from him, we are outside covenant. When we unite with him, we don't just derive a new life. No, we just partake of the life of Christ. So by union between a Jewish woman and a Jewish man who is circumcised, she becomes one with the covenant that the man is in by circumcision, by the separation from the world. And so, if a woman then brings a suggestion to a man who has covenant with God to take a root of good evil, and if the man takes it, then the man has broken covenant with God. Did you see this? And that was why God was about to kill Moses after God encountered him. And God had given him an encounter, and God had sent him with a very powerful message to go to Egypt, to go do his bidding. And as soon as Moses took off and they stopped at the place to camp the rest, I was just saying, the Lord saw Moses and he was about to kill him. Why? Because Moses was circumcised because he was born in the Jewish home, but he was not taught the details of the covenant that is kept in the Jewish nation. He wasn't taught. And so when he left Egypt, Okay, he left Egypt knowing he is a Jew, but he doesn't know the way of the Jews. And so when he got to Jethro and he was given a wife, he had a child and he didn't circumcise his child because he didn't even know about circumcision. Remember, he was circumcised on the eighth day when he was born. And he was raised a little bit and when he was weaned, he was shipped off to Pharaoh's house. And he lived there all his life until he was 40. So he had no understanding of the traditions, the culture, the covenant and the way of his ancestors. So when he gave birth to his child, he just gave birth to a child according to the way of the media. Right? So, so he, he, he didn't... Because Jethro was the priest of media. He, he, he didn't circumcise his child. And so when he was on his way, and he, God had now employed him, and he had sent him on an errand for the king. But that didn't cancel the fact that Moses was out, he was operating out of covenant. Not directly himself, but he has given birth because this God was passionate about descendants. Did you see this? And so because a descendant of Moses was not in compliance, God was about to kill him because he is not keeping the covenant of the, of the, of the, of the relationship that God has with Abraham. And so quickly, the wife quickly took a flint knife and circumcised the son and threw the skin on Moses' feet. The Bible says, and, 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 the, and the angel of the, and the, and the Lord left him. Hello. This is how passionate, or this is how enforceable covenant is. God will kill Moses even though he had employed Moses. He'll just kill him and find someone else. So be careful to enter into a relationship with God and do it carelessly. And this is why. I, I know the judgment of God that is coming upon ministers and servants and, 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 and custodians of, of, of mysteries and of the gospel is going to be great. That's why the Bible says, do not be quick to be a teacher. Because you are responsible for passing across the details of the covenant, the life that the people of God must walk in and must keep. And if people are found breaking covenant under your watch, God will kill you. I'm telling you. He will. Because you have taken the position, Moses has not taken the position of the man sent by God. Yet, his house was out of covenant. And God was not coming to warn him. God was coming to kill him. There is a way, there is a covenant life that God expects of us. And then verse 14 says, Any male who fails to be circumcised will be 
cut off from the covenant family for breaking the covenant. So refusing to be circumcised, which means refusing, which in, in present day time still valid the relevance, refusing to intentionally separate yourself from the world will cut you off from the covenant. So I'm saying to you that you could be saved, but if you still make a practice of sin, which is the way of the world, you will be cut off. Oh, but my salvation is based on what Jesus did, not what I did, so my salvation is eternal. No, it's not. First job, I'll show you. Because I know that this was being preached in the church and Apostle Paul was hammering against it again and again. People began to preach that it was fine to still do certain things as he's done in the world and you will still, it is fine, God is happy with you. That's not true. First John chapter 3. I'm going to read very, very fast because I'm going to pray very shortly. First John chapter 3, I'm going to read very, very fast and I want you to follow me. It says from verse 1, it says, see how much See how very much our Father loves us. For He calls us His children. And this is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know Him. Dear friends, we are already God's children. Okay? We are already in covenant. Did you see this? If you have believed, because this letter was to the church. So if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have accepted, accepted him as your Lord and your personal Savior, and if you have received the Spirit of Christ, if you have received the Holy Ghost, you are already God's children. You are already in covenant. But there is something that you are not, you now need to pay attention to as a consequence or as a result of being God's children. We are already God's children, the Bible says. But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. Verse 4, I'm going closer now. Everyone who sins is breaking God's covenant, okay? Is breaking God's law. Because remember, the covenant that God made is that in those days, I will put my laws in their in their in, in them and I will in their heart. I will put my laws in their heart and I will write my laws in their mind. That is what scripture says, isn't it? That is the covenant. In those days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and by my spirit I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write it in their mind. So everyone who sin is breaking God's law, means is breaking God's covenant. And what does it mean to sin here? It is to follow the ways of the world. The ways of the world is sin. Whoever is controlled by his sinful nature, my Libra Andos, is under the influence of the devil. This is the way he is the spirit at work in the sons of disobedience. And this is why the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 12, it says, be not conformed to this world. Don't follow the ways of the world. Don't make a practice of their custom. They practice sin. So, those of us who are already God's children should be careful that we do not make a practice of their ways, which will be breaking God's law, which means breaking covenant. It means you are taking back the foreskin and you are sticking it back to yourself. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. Did you see that? Verse 5. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sin. Jesus the sacrifice of Jesus, and when the moment you believe in Jesus, your first skin is cut off. Jesus' sacrifice is the cutting away of the first skin, the cutting away of sin. So the action that Abraham took when God told him the responsibility he had in the covenant, and the Bible says, and the same day Abraham took every male child in his family including himself and he circumcised everybody on the same day the cutting away of that flesh is as the, is, is the same thing as what happened when Jesus died his death on the cross is the cutting away and then his resurrection is the life Malibra Adaba, is the pioneering of a life a, a tradition a custom that we must walk in
And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins. And there is no sin in him. Now, verse 6, now this is where I'm going now. Focus on this. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. Anyone who continues to keep, God told the Bible, he said, all your descendants after you from generation to generation must keep. It is a continual responsibility for your descendants to cut away for skin at birth. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin, but anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him. Oh, understand who he is. Anyone who continues to sin does not know him. So you see, you gave your life to Christ and now you are saved. But if you continue to make a practice of sin, if you continue to make a practice of sin, it is considered as breaking covenant with God. And you are now considered as not knowing God and not understanding him. So making a practice of sin is equivalent to not knowing God. So I don't care if you know the name of Jesus. And if you've confessed the name of Jesus, oh, that's not clear enough. Verse 7. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. So it is possible to be deceived about these things. It is possible to think that you can take the world as long as you have accepted Jesus Christ first. And, and, and you've, you've professed him as your Lord and your Savior, you can then begin to meddle with the world. You can then begin to have a fear with anger and still be in covenant. It's impossible. The Bible says, shall we remain in sin and expect grace to abound? God forbid, the Bible says. That means it is possible for someone who is saved, who is saved by grace, to still attempt to enter into sin. And then the person will have an expectation for the grace to remain. That's what Apostle Paul was saying. He said, shall we remain in sin and expect grace? That means people have expectation. People were living in church in those days. They were intermeddling with sin and they still had expectation that the grace of God has saved them will still abound. And Apostle Paul said, God forbid. It means it will not happen. You can't make a practice of sin and still expect to be secured in the covenant of God. Say, don't let us deceive you. Don't let anyone deceive you about this. First John chapter 3, verse 7. When people do what is right, it is shown that they are righteous. Even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil. Did you see this? When people keep on sinning, and these people that keep on sinning, He's talking about the people that have become children of God here. If you have become a child of God and you keep on sinning, he says you belong to the devil. Did you see this? It means you are breaking the code of the covenant life. Because the day you believe in Christ, you entered into a covenant. And this covenant will instigate a life. And it is a life of doing right. It is a life of righteousness. And this life is sponsored and empowered by the grace that the Spirit supplies. But if you make a practice of sin, if you eagerly desire things, and, and what pushes people to sin, remember, is desires. It is through the desires of your heart that temptation will come. In other words, you can never be tempted if you don't have crazy desires or desires that are contrary to the will of God in your heart. It's impossible to be tempted. When you begin to have desires, it is on the premises of those desires that temptation will come. The enemy will suggest to you a way to attain your desire. That's what temptation is. Do you understand that? That's what temptation is. You desire pleasure. So the devil will suggest to you how to receive and how to acquire and how to attain and how to enjoy pleasure. So he will suggest sex to you. He will make suggestions to you because you're already desiring it. When your desires lure you away from God, then temptation will begin to set in. And if you conceive that temptation, then it becomes sin. When you keep on sinning, verse 8, it shows that you belong to the devil who has been sinning 
since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. This works is sin. It is a way of life that he has successfully pioneered and created. And he has handed over to his own descendants, the ones who practice sin. So those who make a practice of sin have received an inheritance from the one who originated sin, the devil. And so, and, and those ones who are in sin too is a covenant. And so to accept Christ is to break covenant with the devil and enter into a covenant with God. But you cannot have two covenants side by side. So if you proclaim God as your Savior, you enter into a covenant and it instigates a life that you must live. And if you now go back again to start mingling with sin, it is considered a breaking of a covenant with God. And naturally you are entering back into a covenant with the devil. And so you would receive the life that he has to give. And the life that he gives is death. Verse 9 says, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. God's life is the covenant life. Do you understand this? Remember I told you the covenant that God had with Adam that was broken was the covenant of perfect fellowship. And this is the spirit life. This is the life that came into us when we accepted Jesus. And we received the Holy Ghost. We received a life. It is God's life. And those who belong to the family of God. Those who have entered into a family tie by covenant with God. The life of God. The covenant life. Is the life that they must make a practice of. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So, we are seeing through scriptures now, the covenant life is a life of righteousness. It's a life of keeping to the code. And God comes to make covenant with people. So there are covenants in covenant. And the covenant way is that there is a life that must follow a covenant. So when God told, when God made a covenant with the family of Aaron to establish them, or to establish priesthood, the intention of God was to establish priesthood in the whole nation. And because the whole nation were falling short of keeping the covenant life, so God had to scale it down to say, look, it's becoming an impossible task for this nation. So let me start from a family. So God took the family of Levi and he made priests and he carved out priesthood out of their family. And because of that, he then, the, there is a life that is not expected of the Levites. Do you understand this? And part of the life is that they must not struggle for inheritance with the children of Israel. They must not work like everybody else work. Their work must be the duties of the temple to model the way of God before the people and to mediate between God and the people to offer sacrifices to God on behalf of the people and to relay the heart of God back to the people this was the life of the priesthood this is a priesthood life and this was a life that was a proceed of a covenant that God caught with their father Error. And the division, so should a Levite now begin to work like every other Jew or begin to seek to have inheritance of land with every other Jew, that, 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 that Levite is breaking covenant. And, and by that, he will be excluded from the commonwealth of the Levites. Do you understand that? So God would approach men with covenants. He will come to you and say, look, I, I need you to do this, this, this for me. And this is my covenant with you. If you do this, 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 I will do this, 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 that. And you, in order to, in order to live and benefit and be secured within the confines of that covenant, you need to find out the way of that covenant. And the way of that covenant is to keep the requirements that God states out. 
with the covenant. And the eternal covenant that God made was that he will be the God of Abraham and all his descendants. And how God made good of this was that he poured out his spirit. And by this spirit, he wrote the terms of the covenant in our hearts and in our mind. What does it mean? this mean? We will be governed from inside out. Let me show you this in scripture again. My Libra Adina Marco says this. First John, the same first John that I just read to you now. Let me show you another scripture. And then I will begin to round up. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 26. He says, I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. Did you see this? Those who want to govern you from outside. Those who want to lead you astray. Those who want to tell you that it is, it is okay to eat of the tree of good and evil. It is okay to do stuff. Don't need to be involved, God. As long as what you're doing is good. And this is what these motivational speakers do, isn't it? And this is the value of this world. They try to model, this is the justice system of this world. They tell you stealing is bad. I don't care how much you say stealing is bad. It is good evil. Because it is not based on the values of God. It is based on the moral codes of conduct set in motion by a nation that has God, that God is void, that, 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 that the values and the morals of God are not included in the guiding principles that pilots the affairs of that nation. So you can make all the laws you like in court and it may sound good, but it's not justice. It is only judgment. There is difference between judgment and justice. What we practice in this world is judgment. It is not justice. Only God is, 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 is able to deliver justice. And the way the justice, the, the infrastructure by which God delivers justice is called wisdom. And that was what, what gave, God gave to Solomon. Because Solomon says, I need the spirit of discernment. How can I judge these people of yours? And then God dealt with Solomon the prerequisite, the prerequisite, the prerequisite for justice. He gave him wisdom. The Bible says, Wisdom, it is by me that kings decree justice, not judgment. Kings decree justice by wisdom. Kings decree justice. Just, just justice. So the and wisdom is spiritual. Wisdom is a product of the spirit of God. They are, it is a treasure that is in Christ. Deliver the delivery system of this treasure is the Holy Ghost. And so any judge that does not have the Holy Ghost cannot give justice. It can't. So you can cry, you can cry Black Lives Matter all you like. You can you can shout and sass all you like. If those who are responsible for dispensing justice do not have the Holy Ghost, it is impossible to receive justice. There will be crime after crime after crime. If you end this, another thing will start and it will not end until God becomes the justice system until God becomes the judge for he is the righteous one. So instead of carrying placards and wasting your time on the streets feeling good that you protested and you are an activist get on your knees and pray. Pray that God raises Righteous leaders, because it is only righteousness that exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach. As long as your sinners are in sin, and even the protesters are in sin, everybody, this is a nation of sin, and, and most of the people that are protesting are sinners. Yeah, you know what you do. You know what you do. And if the justice system that you are counting on to give you justice, a man by people who are void of the values of God. You could never get justice because it is only by wisdom that justice is administered. And the one who gives wisdom is the Holy Ghost. So anyone who is void of the Holy Ghost can never decree justice.
I am writing to you, First John chapter 2, verse 26. I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received. I am warning you. And then your, your fail-safe system against being led astray is verse 27. But you have received the Holy Spirit and He lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. Did you see this? Remember, the Holy Spirit does not teach you what is true. He leads you into truth. There is a difference between true and truth. If you stand on the surface of water, you will sink. That's true. But that's not the truth. The truth is that water can be walked upon. <laughs> If you, if you stand, you try to stand upon water, you will sink. Because as man, man cannot float on, on, on water by standing. If you try to stand upon water, if you try to walk on water, you will sink. And that will be true according to the laws of nature. But you see, truth is not natural. Truth is spiritual. And according to truth, walking on water is, is normal. In fact, sinking is a problem. And it calls for attention. Walking on water is normal. Consistent with truth. But you see, walking on water, attempting to walk on water and sinking is true. As, as, as constant with the laws of nature. So he says, you have received the Holy Spirit who lives within you. You do not need anyone to teach you what is true. In other words, you do not need anyone to bring you good evil. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know because God writes His laws in our hearts by this Spirit. And this Spirit tells you the confident life, the confident way of life that is acceptable before God for you. And what it teaches is true according to that which is consistent with the Spirit. It is not a lie. So just as He has taught you, remain in fellowship. Remain in covenant. Remain in covenant. And what keeps you in covenant is the teachings of the Spirit. Did you see this? What the Spirit teaches you is a life. It teaches you how to live a life that is consistent with covenant. And this is how we can remain in fellowship. Anything outside of the governance that comes from the spirit tabernacle on your inside will lead to a breaking of covenant. Breaking of fellowship. And the consequence is steep. You can't pay. The consequence is steep. You can't pay. So I'm saying to you this morning... That if you have chosen to walk with God, what God intends to give you is a kingdom. There are limitless treasures in Christ. And you have come into a family. But the life in this family is a covenant life. It means it's a, it's a fellowship. It's an intimacy, a bloodline, a family tie by a code of conduct. And if we are to remain in this life, we must keep the way of this life. And the one who intimates us with the way of this life is the Holy Spirit. And that is why the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 12, it says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does your mind get renewed? Renewing of your mind simply means the law of God being written in your mind. Did you see this? Because the Bible says in those days, I will write my laws in their hearts. No, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write it in their mind. By the putting of the law, by the entrance of the Holy Ghost into your heart, and he begins to teach you the ways of covenant. And then you intentionally bring your soul under the government of the Spirit. 
And that is how the laws of God get written in your soul. And that affects all your actions. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And it says, so that you will be able to prove that which is the good and perfect will of God for you. You will be able to prove the will of God for you. We are all called into an assignment. Our assignment may differ, but it is for the same goal. And according to the differences in our assignment, God will cut covenants within the main covenant. And the covenant that God cuts with you will, end the, it will, will, will require you to walk a certain way. And the one who teaches you to walk the way of your covenant is the Holy Ghost. So if you don't make the Holy Spirit your best friend, your intimate friend, your go-to at all times, your standby, your help and your and your teacher, you will err, you will walk out of alignment. You because what will happen is you will eat the food. The devil will he says you will need no one to teach you. If you do not accept the teaching of the Holy Spirit, you will somebody else has to teach you because we are we are created to be taught. Human beings are created to be led, not to self-govern. We are created to be led. And it's either you are led by the Spirit of God or you are led by the Spirit of this world. And the moment you start feeling like you know everything about the Holy Ghost and you know this God thing, I get it, I've, I've, I've got to figure it out. In that moment, the Holy Spirit will take a back seat. The Bible says that when the Spirit of God left Saul, an evil spirit replaced. You will begin to find anger attractive because already you have a desire to attain certain things. And the problem is the desire starts, God may put the God may put a big picture in your heart. Do you understand this? This is the problem with the people of, of God. God will put a big picture. So you started with God, and He had already projected images and pictures of an end to you. Just like He gave Joseph a dream. Imagine Joseph now says, Look. I know God showed me a dream that I will be great. And I am now a servant in the house of a man who is great in Egypt. And his wife is making advances to me. Maybe if I sleep with the wife, you know, it can propel me. Just push me forward. Just push me forward. Maybe it can give me a certain level of freedom so that I can then try to fight for a bigger... You know, it can, it can begin to think of the ways of the world because this is how the world advances in it people will sleep with people to advance their career people will get into dodgy relationships to forge ahead in their pursuit in life that is what is called ambition isn't it so if you are not driven by passion you will become ambitious the passion of god you will become ambitious and, and the problem is the big picture that you will still be aiming for will be the vision that God showed you, will be the destination that God showed you. But now you will have eaten the tree of good evil to attain to get to that destination. That's what Adam did. The devil says, did God tell you not to eat of this fruit? He says, surely. If you eat it, he says, the day you eat it, you will be like God. And so Adam felt, oh, okay, I know God is taking me on a journey. But so there is a shortcut. So if God said I shouldn't eat this, that means God, God wanted me to get to that destination by a way that he wants to be kept exclusive to himself. But now I want to be involved in the way. So I will eat it. Because think about it. What the devil put in front of him is that you will be like God. That God is already with him. That God is already in a relationship with him. Do you understand this? So the destination was already in front of him. So what the devil wanted to control was the means of attaining that destination. So the devil provided and proposed an alternative. If you don't become intimate with the ways of the Spirit or the Holy Spirit, the enemy will propose an alternative and there is a very, very high likelihood that you will take it because you will still feel like, I'm trying to fulfill God's purpose. I'm trying to get to God's destination. The destination he showed me. God showed me this. God showed me that. And so the way the devil hijacks and sabotages the destinies of men is he will win you. He will make you make light of spiritual things. You will start getting less spiritual, but you are still calling yourself a child of God. You will still be going to church, but you will be coming, you will pray less. Your emphasis on the word and prayer will begin to decrease. And your emphasis on prosperity and influence and doing God's work and those things will begin to gain mileage. Or begin to gain grounds in you. And then on that platform of pursuing 
or run in to become what God showed you in the beginning, the devil will offer you. Listen to me. When the devil took Jesus to the mountain and he showed him the glory of this world, he, he knew that this was what this guy came to take back. That if truly this is the Son of God, because he knew the atrocity he had committed, he knew that he stole something that belonged to the children of God. He knew. And he knew that if God makes an entrance into the earth, there is only one thing God wants. God wants to take back what he stole. It's as simple as that. So he offered Jesus outright. He said, look, this is it. This is it. I will give it to you if you worship God. If you worship me. If you do, if you take my proposal, if you do it my own way, you arrive at this destination. I know this is where you're going. Because the Bible would then say in Revelation, it says the kingdoms of this world has now become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. So the devil knows that God wants to take back the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. He wants to take it back. So the devil offered it to Jesus. He said, look, don't, 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 don't stretch yourself. Don't go God's way. This is what you want. Here it is. Here. Let's make a deal. Let Enter into a covenant with me and take it. So I beseech you, brothers and sisters, wherever you're watching me from all over the world, the best place to be is in a covenant with God. And if you enter into a covenant with God, there is a life that is expected of you. The danger of not living that life, and that life can only be taught you by the Holy Spirit. The danger of not intimating yourself with the Holy Spirit so that it can teach you that life is that you will wander out of fellowship. The enemy will bring proposals to you like he did to Abraham through his wife, like he did to Adam through his wife. The enemy will bring a proposal to you. He will propose good evil to you. He will propose evil evil to you. He will propose good evil to you. Doing money ritual to get, doing blood sacrifice and ritual to get money is good evil. Because gold and silver was created by God, so it's good. Because the Bible says everything God created was good. But to go get gold by sacrificing human life, that is good evil now. It does not work the purposes of God. It is not God's route of getting to that destination. So whatever it is you're doing in life, because I've spoken to people, excuse me, and most times when I speak to, when I try to evangelize to people, when I try to tell people about God, their response is, well, I'm doing well, I'm okay, I'm fine. No, bro, you're not fine. What you have is good evil. If what you have did not come from God, if what you have is not based, in you, if the life that you're living is not sponsored by the help of the Holy Spirit, if how you define things didn't come from the dictionaries of heaven, then all you have that looks good to you is still evil. It is good evil. And that's exactly where the devil wants you to be. He wants you to think you are still pursuing God's desire. And get it at all costs. Just It doesn't matter what destination you're going to. So I've heard people say, just give. And, and don't worry. God will take care of your shortcomings. Just give. No. 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 Pay attention to the shortcoming. Pay attention and appropriate the righteousness that Jesus purchased. Be, be intentional about being holy. Because the Bible made it, the Bible made it clear. It says, "Be ye holy, as your Father in heaven is holy." And the scripture that I read to you in First John chapter three, it says, "It says, make no mistake. Whoever does right, that is person that is righteous. And whoever makes a practice of sin belongs to the devil. So if you're making a practice of sin and you think bringing the sacrifice to God, you're still living. You're going back to the Old Testament. That's what you're doing. You're behaving like those guys who just feels bringing God bulls and rams just makes God back off from them." It doesn't work that way. If living a righteous life is not your priority and your only priority, then you are breaking covenant. And perhaps if you don't even know what righteous life even means, you have not even started living life at all. You are still walking in darkness. And so I, I invite you this morning, in view of God's mercy, I invite you this morning to... The family of God. I invite you to the family of God. That you can partake of this common wealth that God has in his family. 
and the inheritance that God intends to give to those who covenants with him. And so therefore, if you would acknowledge that Jesus came into this world to die for you, to call a covenant by which you can enter back into the family of God. If you believe that he died and he was raised to life by God, and that everything he did, you were, you was considered in his sacrifice. And you were included in his sacrifice. If you believe that, then you are saved. And confess it with your mouth and say, Jesus is now my Lord. He is now, he now, my life now belongs to him. I do not have my life anymore. The life that I would live now is the life that he dictates to me. And how does he dictate his life to you? He fills you with his spirit, the Holy Spirit, who begins to write the laws of God, the terms of this covenant. He begins to write it in your heart. And this will instigate the life that you begin to live. This is how to keep perfect fellowship. And if you keep this fellowship, then you will see Christ when he returns. And you will inherit the kingdom of God from now. And even in the world after. And so I pray for you in the name of Jesus. That Christ make his home in your heart. That as Christ knocks the doors of your heart this afternoon, that you will open the door that he may come in. That you will receive the power to obey God. That God will create in you an obedient heart. In the name of Jesus, a meek heart to receive with meekness the word of God. The word of grace that is able to build you and to give you an inheritance. In the name of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit will indwell you. And that the Holy Spirit will begin to write the laws of God in your heart. And that you will receive the spirit of obedience to follow the government of light, the government of the spirit. And the anointing that God has anointed you for a special assignment will teach you the way of the anointing. What that means is the covenant that God has caught with you. To walk a certain walk with him. That you will walk according to the terms of that covenant. The anointing will teach you the way of the anointing that God has put upon your life. That your ordination will not be in vain. In the name of Jesus. And that the benefits of keeping the ways of covenant will begin to manifest in your life. In the name of Jesus. That you will, you will walk in dominion. You will walk in, in, in strength. You will walk in wisdom. That God will give you wisdom. In the name of Jesus. And if you function in any leadership capacity, I pray that God gives you wisdom. So that you can administer justice. So that you can lead and pioneer a movement of righteousness that will glorify the Lord. In Jesus' most powerful name. Amen and amen and amen. And I pray that all sick bodies be healed. And everyone that is confused receive light in the name of Jesus. And if there is any problem that you have that I have not mentioned, God knows it. And as you have faith in him, God will solve every problem in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. There is still a scripture that I wanted to read today. And it's in the book of um, 2 Peter. Um, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. The Bible says, God has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. God has given us everything that we need to live this covenant life. And the way God gives it is He supplies it to us by His Spirit. So please let the Holy Spirit become your best friend from today. And if you don't know about Him, um, reach out to us. We will teach you. All we teach here um, is intimacy with the Holy Spirit, is friendship with the Holy Spirit, and a life led, inspired, and governed by the Holy Spirit. Um, so um, you can go and listen to all our tapes back on SoundCloud. Um, on YouTube, Live Spring Assembly, LSA London, um, on, on Periscope. Um, you can listen back to all our messages on Periscope and of, of course on Facebook. And of course, there's still one more scripture that I didn't read and it's in the book of Second Peter. So I'm going to keep that probably till Friday. Okay. Um, so um, whatever I'm speaking about on Friday, I will read that scripture to you. I will remind you that it was part of today's service. Um, I'll read the scripture to you and then of course we'll do whatever we have to do. Whatever God um, wants to speak about on Friday, we'll talk about it. Um, I love you so much. God bless you. I'm going to see you on Friday. Um, hey, before Friday, Thursday, the prayer altar continues. 
Um, if you want to join the prayer altar, we are on a marathon prayer in this month of October. We've been praying every single day. Or well, every Thursday, we call people together to pray. Okay, so if you want to be part of that prayer movement um, on th every Thursday in October, please DM us on any of our social media handles and we will get you added to the prayer campaign. Um, and I'll look forward to seeing you on Thursday. Um, until then, keep keeping the kingdom. Enjoy the rest of your week. Have a fruitful and a delightful week ahead. Um, I pray that this week the Holy Spirit will introduce himself to you in a way you've never seen before. And you will enjoy intimacy with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. I love you so much. I'll see you on Friday, on Thursday and on Friday. Until then, God bless.